This is SciBite, episode 132, for May 27th, 2014. everyone, and welcome back to SciBite, Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly science podcast, live on a Tuesday and fresh on a Wednesday over at jupiterbroadcasting.com. My name is Chris, and joining us every single week is our host, Heather. Hey there, Heather. Hey there, Chris. Hey, Heather. Happy science to you. Happy science. So what are we going to talk about today? Today, we're going to take a look at resurrecting a space probe, classroom decorations, brain control, viewer feedback, a three-year look back at SciBite. Curiosity news, and as always, take a peek back into history and up in the sky this week. Sounds like quite a show. Well, I have a humble suggestion. Why don't we kick it off with the news? Okay, Heather, where do we begin today? There's an independent team of engineers that has been recovering old imaging from magnetic tape reels from, you know, lunar orbiter missions. And now they've decided to accomplish an achievement that has never been done before to turn on, command, and maneuver a space NASA spacecraft that has been abandoned for a long time. Wow. So this was originally a mission uh, between NASA and the ESRO, ESA, to study the interaction between Earth's magnetic field and the solar wind. So go back, I think it was launched in 1976. They do that mission. Then they say, hey, cool, it still works. Now we'll need to, now we can switch and they started the International Comet- Cometary Explorer on June 10th, 1982. It was switched over to that, and they could watch between solar wind and the cometary atmosphere. Now, it didn't have any cameras, but they were still able to look at everything that was going on. They are able to um, fly by uh, Comet Haley in 86. Hmm. But still, it was just kind of, it reached that point, and then it was, it was edited in 19... Uh, 97, NASA said, all right, mission's over. The probe, the shutdown mission said, all right, we'll just kind of leave the carrier signal on so that we can just kind of see that it's there. Now, in 2000, fast forward to 2008, they see, hey, it was never actually powered off the last time we talked to it. <laughs> and in fact, all but one of its 13 experiments are still functioning and it still has some propellant left. Wow. So now fast forward um, a little bit more. In earlier this year, people at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center said, you know, the deep space network equipment needed to transmit the signals has been dis- was discommissioned in 99. There's no economically feasible way to uh. replace it because this is, you know, equipment needed from to contact it was from 1970s. Yeah, old 1980s. stuff. 1980s. Yeah, old and stuff. Now they don't have that anymore. So they're like, okay, well, we're not going to rebuild all that equipment just to talk to one little spacecraft. Enter in the community. Oh, okay. So now this independent team of engineers decided, hey, they were work- previously working on old uh, Apollo error um, magnetic tape reels because a lot of that stuff has disappeared or be written over. But NASA has some of this stuff, but they got rid of all the equipment to read it. So they've been kind of working on um, creating the equipment needed to go back and look at it. Wow. Are you serious? Yeah. So they've recreated that kind of stuff. So they're going back and they're pulling out the data by creating the equipment needed to read the data that NASA has. That's amazing. So they're doing that. And they said, hey, there's we're kind of looking off to the side. and like, hey, there's this satellite. I bet we could do something with it. So they started looking at, you know, how feasible, how challenging would it be to actually for this group of engineers all by themselves to talk to the satellite and start doing it, um, controlling it. They said, you know, it's like, we intended to do it. So they went through and they did a crowdsourcing. It's like, okay, everybody (laughs) pitch in your dollars. Let's see what we can do. Yeah. And so they they estimated the cost of writing the software because they looked at it and they said, okay, well, some of this equipment they could go out and they could dig up. They could sort of cobble it together on their own. And the rest of it, they could make the computers themselves digitally recreate that. So make the, uh, have the computer 
make the signal appear like it had been back in 1976 so that the satellite itself could, you know, hear them and talk back to them about it. So they said, okay, well, now I hit to the point where it's coming back towards Earth, which is why the old interest in this came back up again. It's not going to be back around this close to Earth for three or four decades. So then they looked at it like, okay, we have a time window. They needed to talk to it by the end of this month. Um, because if they could talk to it by the end of May, then they can start doing minor course adjustments and make it um, orbit Earth again, or you know, in the in this area. So then they can maybe start looking at a different comet to search at, to go after. Mm -hmm. So you know, this is thirty years of stuff. They're going back. They're trying to dig up documents and on this spacecraft because they don't really have necessarily a lot of the stuff still there for the detail of it at NASA. So they went to like the engineers who made them like going to their houses. They're like, hey, do you have any of this copies? Of this? And that's some of the people had copies of things that they went through. Some of it was um, things that were open to the public that you could go, that they could just dig through so much, um, you know, programming and data to see what they could pull out from uh, information about this satellite from that. And then NASA also sort of gave them some limited you know, open access for them to kind of go through. Now, so we, now you have the soft, between the software and the hardware they have, they can now send those command and transmissions to this uh, satellite that can actually understand it. And they were able to take some of it in uh, the hardware needed, and they were able to install it on the 305 uh, Arecibo dish antenna. So they were able to get it on this big, uh, the deep space, one of the deep space antennas. And so, so they're going through, they have that, they have, there's no actual computer on the spacecraft itself, mm. which actually makes it easier because they, they have to directly command it. There is no, you know, sending up a little programming <laughs> right. list. To right. do it. It's directly do this and it does that. <laughs> right. Now do this. So it makes it easier on their part for that, just because it is just send one command, send one command, listen to stuff coming back. Now, NASA didn't make any funding into this project. Mm -hmm. They gave, you know, it's like, okay, well, you can talk to our people. We'll talk to you. You know, yes, you may try to talk to it and um, see what happens. They wanted, you know, like, well, go see what the public actually is into this sort of thing. And obviously there was a lot of interest. And they actually hit... Um, you know, their crowdsourcing milestone, they hit a stretch reach so that's, they could... That's so cool to use that kind of thing for this. A, yeah, and they're with uh, some of it, they were able to buy time off of the Deep Space Network, this Deep Space tells, um, Communications Network that NASA uses to go and talk to the Voyagers and all those different things that are way out there. They were able to buy some time off of that and say, <laughs> we need some hours off this. We're going to pay for those hours. And... For the first time ever, NASA actually signed an agreement. It's the non reimbursable Space Act Agreement, which is really the first time NASA, because everything it does, it says stamp, that's ours forever. Any of the, the uh, Apollo engines that have been recovered from the bottom of the ocean, everything still belongs to NASA. Mm. And they say, right, we'll let you borrow this. Okay. Now, in this specific case, they said, all right, we are going to sign a special agreement that means... We had no plan to ever touch this again, that it is, you know, out of our hands. We didn't care about it anymore. Now you're going to do something with it. And so they're, they're allowing this team to actually take over the whole project and move forward with it. Hmm. This is a really unique, I, I've, am I right? I mean, I've never heard of anything oh, it's like in, this. Well, no, because most of the time they're going to use these satellite, uh, they're going to use these probes up until the last minute. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, until they, you know, crash into whatever it is. And I, send it I would out assume and they they'd have to, to almost from a... Or runs out of power. Yeah, I would think they'd have to do that from a, a budget standpoint even. Yeah, well, that's that's it too, is you reach a point where it's, you know, budgetary reasons say, hey, there's nothing there. Like the, there was a scare that, you know, oh my goodness, we won't have money for the Opportunity Rover. Right. You know, it's still there. Its solar panels are still, you know, getting power for the Rover, but happens if they run out of money then there's nothing there it's just sitting there yeah poor over all alone but in this case it was one of those things where it's 20 30 years later you're like huh that thing didn't get turned off who forgot to turn off lights 
I've, Some I, breaths turn off the lights. I ran into a few Novell Netware servers that are kind of like that. Oh, that's that's in the closet still running? Oh, huh, somebody for yeah. I forgot to shut that down. Well, that's pretty cool. And it's pretty neat but, how, how crowdfunding can play a role in that. Yeah, and so they're actually, yeah, they're talking to it. It's happening like right now. They talk to it on the 19th. So they're in the process of getting the final pro, uh, words out to say, hey, fire the thrusters. And it's, so they've got a very specific set of times where they need to fire the thrusters at this specific moment and that specific moment for just barely. Wow. Because he's a very slow-moving thing. So if they can adjust its orbit, yeah. huh. then they're going to be controlling a space probe that was sent into space in 1976 and given up for lost. Hmm. And crowdsourcing actually got it together and said, hey, we want to support science and we're going to do this. Hollywood should buy the rights to this story and then turn it around. And it's an evil genius who takes control of a whole fleet of abandoned satellites <laughs> and turns them back around on the Earth. It's a great plot line, Heather. What is it? One tweet I got was like, hey, hackers grab and, and right. take over a satellite from right. NASA. Like, yeah. Mm. yeah, not quite. Not quite. All right, Heather. Well, guess what? Let's take a little, uh, just a little pause right here. You know, uh, this is the uh, third anniversary of the SciBite program. And one of the facts about uh, both uh, SciBite and the Faux Show is they kind of were uh, born from the fire that is Jupiter at night. And uh, so kind of an exciting announcement that was made on today's Linux Unplugged. Next week, a uh, daily show is being launched on the Jupiter Broadcasting Network. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. I know. I know. I don't know what I was thinking. Uh, but it's called, uh, it's, uh, get ready for this, Tech Talk Today. How do you like that? Tech Talk Today. And there's uh, more details about it in episode 42 of Linux Unplugged, Fine Wine or Sour Ports, episode 42. And uh, it'll be Monday through Thursday, starting at 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern, 7 p.m. GMT over jblive.tv. It'll be tech news and things like that from the perspective of the Jupiter Broadcasting community with a rotating cast of characters who will join me on the morning show. So it should be live, if all goes as planned, on Monday, June 6th, I think, right? I think that's... Let me check my calendar here. Yes, no, I'm sorry, June 2nd, not 6th. 6th is the Friday. So it should start on Monday, June 2nd, over at jblive.tv. I'd love to have you come join me in the live stream. And uh, I'm hoping the 9 a.m. time works well for you because uh, it's 9 on the uh, West Coast and it is uh, noon in the lunchtime and we should be able to have it out for your evening commute as well over at jupiterbroadcasting.com. So there you go. New show, Tech Talk Today, launching next Monday on the Jupiter Broadcasting Network. And Heather? Yes. With that done, it's time for the News Bite. Okay. Yeah, it's a little JB every single day, exactly. So what are we talking about in the News Bite? There's new research from Carnegie Mellon University that shows that too much materials covering a classroom may end up destructing attention and oh. learning oh. in kids. Oh. Hmm. So it makes complete sense to me. And actually, as to me, it does too. I, I spent a lot of time in class looking at crap on the wall that I'd seen a hundred times. Yes. Well, even now, I have to watch out for what I have around my desk. But these <laughs> researchers specifically went through and they said, all right. We're going to, to judge, and there's like, you know, in a highly decorated classroom, and then take these 24 kindergarten students. Of course, we're going to just say that works on kindergarten students and not us as well. Of course, of course. Um, in laboratory classrooms, six different introductory science topics. Science! And they said they, they were unfamiliar with it. So they went, three lessons were taught in the heavily decorated classroom, three with pretty much just blank walls. And they were showing that the kids learn in both types. They were more likely to be uh, distracted, and being off task, air quotes, hmm. uh, you know, for behavior. Let's uh, see, in the decorated classroom, almost 39% of the time, but in the sparse classroom, 28% of the time. So there was definitely a 10% kind of gap there, whether they were more distracted doing off task things. Now, they're interested in finding out you know, if some of all the displays were removed. Does that just sort of shift their attention elsewhere? Or what kind of is the proper balance of, you, know, you need some sort of decorations or something on there. Yeah, because you don't want it to be like a drab, dreary. Yeah, that sounds. Yeah, just white walls is sad. Yeah, exactly. But 
So now there is sort of this question as to what is the balance. So I haven't, I can't have just blank walls around my desk. So I have a couple of things, but you know, there's the, the things that kind of like are constant, like moving. I like have little batteries that will talk that way mm-hmm. or rotate. I cannot have those on. Because <laughs> if I have those type of things on, that? that I'm staring that? at that, and I'm like, that? well, I get like almost like hypnotized by it. So it's like something is there. It's too distracting. Yeah. Then you're like, that must go away. That's funny. Yeah. I. So it, it's just that balance of. It is definitely a balance because you don't want to go too far in the wrong direction. That yes. would be a bad thing. And I don't think any of us can blame our classroom decorated walls. No. Like, it wasn't that I was not paying attention, teacher. Your pictures are, are too, too many too distracting. Pictures. It's your fault. It's you made your room too distracting. It's your fault. Yeah, and you know, the teachers, the rooms you love to go in are the ones where they go all, all out on the decoration, too. Yeah. Uh, oh, Gabe, guess what? The band just got here. Let's bring him in because it's time for the two by two. Let's go. All right, Heather, what are we talking about in the two-byte news? All right. If the last conversation about being distracted didn't make you filled with, like, huh, scientists have now demonstrated the feasibility of flying via brain control with actually fairly good accuracy. Brain control. Hmm. Yes. So it's um, uh, EEG is attached to your head. So it's one of those caps where it's like all the little uh, electrodes so they can kind of read brain waves. And they did it. And they had six, seven subjects in a flight simulator test. <laughs> Everything from one person who had no experience whatsoever. <laughs> and they popped them all in. They're like, all right, think the commands required to fly. Okay, I'm they loving actually would have the same type of thing that they would for have for a flying license for quick test. Now, most of them were able to manage landing, even though they're really poor visibility. Hmm. And so now they're focusing on, okay, they were quite amazed that even the person who had no experience in a cockpit did fairly well, but probably could have passed the test. Now we know that we don't need any decorations on the, you know, in the cockpit because then you'll get distracted while flying and that wouldn't be good. But now they're kind of looking at, all right, so what kind of control systems are required? Because a lot of uh, feedback, you know, pi- pilots can feel the resistance in the steering or, mm-hmm. you know, they need a specific amount of force mm-hmm. uh, for when the aircraft become too large or when it's shifted that way or this way. So they're trying to figure out, okay, what kind of feedback system can we make um, if it's just using brain control? So they're kind of saying, all right, well, what kind of feedback can we use to say, hey, the airplane isn't very happy that what you're doing right there. But the fact that you might, that a pilot might be able to fly an airplane via brain control means you need no one with ADD. <laughs> That's for sure. You're like, blah, blah, blah. oh, wait, wait, wait. I didn't mean that. I really was staying on task in my brain. And I, you got to wonder about that feedback system, because what if it's like, yeah, that pain in your butt, that's losing altitude. And uh, when your when your arm itches, that means you're banking too far to the left. You know that those I kinds see. of things. Yeah. So you always kind of wonder, and like, hope that you don't actually have allergies. So you're like, right. Just itching. You're like, oh no, we're banking to the left. Wait, wait. No, we're not. We're not. We're not. Right. Well, uh, Heather, I, I got a little warning for you here. So you know, here at JB One, we've got the side by two thousand. I keep it right here next to me. Uh, for I uh-huh. keep it. It's dedicated to Cybite. It, it is uh-huh. a little uh, from a time past. And unfortunately, oh, no. we've done some oh, recent no. remodeling, uh, but there is a, uh-huh. a button here that's flashing at me. This is either a Cybite 2000 mind control device that works similar to that airplane thing, only um, not quite the same way, or it is viewer feedback. So I'm going to go ahead and press it, Heather. And okay. uh, here we go. Oh, jeez. Okay. We need to move that button I, far away from everything else. I thought it was going to wipe the memory of every listener for a second. Well, I'm glad that didn't that happen. We do have some viewer feedback, though, don't we? We do. On the Twitters from Michael Thallum, we had pointing out that a story that Jupiter's Great Red Spot is shrinking to the smallest size ever seen. Oh, bummer. So the recent Hubble Space Telescope's operations actually confirm that the spot, uh, the Great Red Spot on Jupiter is that it's the smallest diameter it's ever been measured at just under uh, uh, 10,250 miles. Now, 
Now, that's over the time that we've been able to see. Amateur astronomers have said, hey, we think there is a shrinkage. We're, we're locating it. We say that there's, you know, the, quote, waistline, the how wide it is of this of it was getting smaller. So it's becoming more circular, even though because the north-south has not changed very much. But, so the amateurs and astronomers have been saying that for a little while, but now Hubble Space Telescope has specific measurements over that time. And in fact, going back and using historical sketches back from the 1800s, huh. they can sort of guesstimate that it was, it, then it was like 25,000. Over, over 25,000 miles, and now it's a little over 10,000. So, so what you're quite saying, a big difference here. You're saying is Jupiter is going through climate change? Uh, In a sense. Science is ignoring that. <laughs> okay. All right. I just, uh, well, there is some question as to what is going on to cause this storm to shrink so much. I mean, dying right? out. Yeah. You know, their new observations are showing that there's small little eddies feeding into the great uh red spot sure which could be ex- responsible for some change by you know if it's tweaking with the internal dynamics of the uh of it it is a giant storm it yeah. is like a giant hurricane if you start adding in various dynamics obviously that's going to change that or um you know alter that speed in some way so it looks like exactly like the speed where it's uh, angular momentum, you know, where the skaters, they pull in their arms and it spins up even faster. This is the kind of same thing where they're saying the storm is sort of shrinking a bit and spinning faster. Now, which is causing which? Are the faster winds helping to shrink it? Hmm. Or are <laughs> the faster winds sort of starting to help kind of right. give it a jump start again? Yeah. But there's this theory where it's like, well, we've seen the great red spot as long as people have been looking at Jupiter, now amateur astronomers have been kind of like, hey, it's hard to see. It's not as exciting anymore. <laughs> and now it's wondering where, like, at this rate, is it going to be something that goes away? We've always sort of seen it as this permanent storm, this permanent spot on Jupiter. That's everyone thinks. Yeah. When you the creepy you know, one of the creepiest of things in the solar system in a way. There's sometimes there's a giant little red spot drip drawn on it. Yeah. But will it go away eventually? Is it just shrinking? Will it grow again? Is it how is it going to change? It's very, very much taking it one day at a time and kind of actually looking very carefully at the situation and figuring out what's what's going to happen with it. I uh, I'm gonna uh, I got one more thing to trigger here. Now this is the update file on the side by two thousand. I'll go ahead and trigger this. We'll see what we get here. Oh, we update successful. We have a little uh, self update, don't we, Heather? We do this. Week marks three years of Cybite. Yay! Oh my goodness, three years. Where did they go? I know. So, yes, started. Was it? Where did we start? That was way back uh, when you were doing Jupiter at night. Yes. Yeah. And uh, there was some Wednesdays. I think God, something was happening where you were only down to one host, and I was like, "Hey, science!" So science we, Wednesdays yeah. or something science like, Wednesdays. Yeah. Yeah, and then it kind of broke off on its own. The beginning was uh, I was with Jeremy and it was really it was virtual studio. He episode did a lot one, of, yeah. He did a lot of input on that to where it was a lot of effort into video editing and cutting and putting in videos. It would take Jeremy like a week to put together an episode of Sidebite. Yes, yeah. and obviously that hit a bump. Uh, you know, Jeremy had to when he moved on, and then it was you, and you still you did still some video stuff. It was much more condensed. Yeah. It was one run through. Yeah. Keep it together. Yeah. We we went from multiple takes to one take. <laughs> it was one take. Yeah. You're good. Let's move on. <laughs> well, I'm This guy's yellow. Like you said it. Now you can't take it back. Yeah. <laughs> and then we moved to you know, the video once a month, and now we're on the enhanced audio. Mm-hmm. It just lets us go much faster. We also yeah. had a couple of uh, Google Hangouts with Nikki. Yeah, summer, from Jupiter. summer side bite. The summer side bites when we took a little hiatus here on uh, Jupiter Broadcasting. And every once in a while, when there's uh, something happens with the schedules, she's able to hop in and uh, pitch it. Yeah, it's, and Hangouts hop makes on. that so great, too, because you oh, just yeah. both get on Google+, Plus, you can broadcast it, and then you can publish it right to YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. That's really nice. We could have posted that. Do you have links to those in the show notes by any chance? 
uh, those specific episodes. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't. Okay. Mm, I'm Sorry. not sure that I People do. People can probably do some Googling and find them. Yeah. Uh, was it? Oh, I did go back and I was interested. No, I use science as an adjective, a noun, and a verb now. Now it's happy science. Right. Science is science does this. Or let's science that. That feels like that was in the last probably hundred or episodes or so, right? That started on Sci-Bite 8. No and actually, way. And it wasn't actually in the show. It was, I remember it happening and then Jeremy um, did some outtakes at the end. And it was there. I've it got was an to out that specific moment. It was oh, an Oh, you're kidding. Oh, hold on. I we got to go find it. That's that's great. I'll go it's look for this. clicking right there. And it was, uh, I don't know how much the setup is, is we were talking about something and he started singing. Let's see. Because he really likes to sing. And I wanted to cop in. You have to tell me when it pops up. There it is. And it was. Are you going to play it? Yeah. <laughs> Science is sad. <laughs> there we go. That's there's the old virtual set too. Yep. No, uh, but you were saying that uh, science is sad. There it is, Heather. Yep. And that was, ep like, no, episode and was like, eight. Oh, yep. Sad face. Yeah. Yep. And that that was where it all started. So science started having <laughs> its own. It was its own being. It had its own emotions. I like uh, I like that. Space I was looking background. back and I was like, where did that come from? I was like, oh yeah. Wow, good find. How did you find that? I was trying to remember it. It suddenly struck me. I was like, oh, yeah. Now I had to go back forward to kind of – I knew it was in an outtake. So I had to go through those first episodes and, like, click right to the end. There's no way I could remember something like that from episode eight. That's – I'm pretty impressed, to be honest with you. Well, I only remember because of the outtakes were yeah. hilarious. Yeah, yeah. Those are always fun. I watch the outtakes yeah. there at the end. <laughs> and I was like, I remember. I remember, like – because I over so over exaggerated, I was like, mm. yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, and then of course we've covered some really interesting science throughout the life of the show too. Oh yeah, I mean we've seen uh, some of the big major things, you know, private space travel. You know, it started off as just sort of this idea of them going, hey, I think we could do this, to sort of engineering it, testing it. Now we have SpaceX and Virgin Galactic. SpaceX yeah. is yeah. delivering things to the space station fairly consistently, they're moving forward towards uh, manned capsules so we can actually pay them to send people up to the space station themselves. Mm -hmm. We've seen uh, the, opportunity, the Opportunity rover is kind of keeps chucking along. It's yeah. had its solar panels clean a couple of times. <laughs> and, of course, Curiosity. Yeah, it's Curiosity. And it's, curiosity. Rover, yeah. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's landing and confirmation of you know running and standing water and saying, hey, yes, there were ancient habitable locations here. Been drilling into rocks. Now it's continuing to go, and I may have been slightly excited about that with the you know username is Mars Base. It's right. totally, totally possible. Um, unbiased. Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, sure, of course, of course, yeah, of course. Well, we've seen a lot of other uh, progress over the time. Uh, something near and dear to our hearts is all the different Alzheimer's research yeah. that has come about. Yep. In all the steps forward and ideas mm -hmm. and saying, all right, well, these drugs help. Those mm -hmm. drugs help. Let this is causing this part. Yeah, that really feels like there's been an acceleration there over the last couple of years. Yeah, we've seen the Voyagers um, leave the solar system multiple, yeah. multiple, multiple times, and then for real, <laughs> yeah. actually, yes, for realsies. Yes, yeah. Uh, all the different exoplanet stuff that's come out, you know, through um, the Kepler data, watching little dips in the starlight, and even if Kepler isn't, yeah, necessarily there. Uh, all the data, tons of back data is still there for us to go through. You know, it's consistent to find new information about exoplanets. It's going to pop up at least once a month that I'll be able to see that and say, hey, look at that. Yeah. You know, all the different medical research about uh, the senses where we've had uh, recently about bringing hearing or all the different times where we've seen um, the eyes, where chips on the eye, mm -hmm. in the on the retina of the eyes to say, sort of help people with uh, senses that they may have lost. I'll throw two at you from for me. That I mean, your list pretty mm -hmm. much echoes exactly what I would say, uh, except for I would potentially add. You've shown us some really interesting advances in robotics in both like yes. the kinds that are hooked up to humans, but also like the the like the the animal kind. Uh, oh yes, Boston Dynamics. Yes, yes, and then those the, guys are crazy. The other. That's the other story that was kind of big was the Higgs boson uh, possible confirmation. Uh, that was yes, that was huge. Oh yeah, I got them Nobel in physics, and it was you know it was 
it was really amazing to see the guy who theorized it so many decades ago saying being able to be there yeah. when they announced where the you know, two teams were there they announced like we both see this same data which means it's within the amount uh within the error error that says hey we're pretty sure this is here and it's it's a particle that looks very very much like it and as the data went forward right until they started uh, gearing the gearing the uh, large hadron collider down for the upgrade it was pretty much confirmed that yes as far as we know this is what it is and seeing the guys the two guys that theorized it so many decades ago they were just there they Get were to see really it realized. emotional yeah yeah to actually see it like they were, you know like i never thought that they'd actually prove this true or not in my lifetime right right and now I'm here to see it. Yeah. Oh, I see you also have faster than light neutrinos down here on this list. Yes, when there was that, even you have really crazy breaking science. And it was, they had the brief story of, hey, we think yeah. neutrinos are going faster than the speed of light. And everyone was kind of frozen as to how excited to be or how skeptical to be. Right. And in the end, the skeptical side won. There was you know some hardware issues, but that really happens with, that science yeah you know you say you know you get some really good results and you know often in the lab i'm like wow this is really good yeah, mm. yeah. <laughs> now i'm suspicious yeah so then you go back and you have to look at everything but for that shining moment you're really excited and then you're like is this too good to be true <laughs> and that's why science retests then you retest and retest, you retest and figure yeah. out that's a good lesson you know what's what's going on but it's one of those even those bright moments were interesting to kind of re remind me of where all the different places we've gone where we've seen mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah and it seems to be a really good time to be observing all of this that's what's been so great about 132 oh, yeah. episodes of it is we've chronicled some really kind of historical stuff in a way now it's kind of neat yeah. to have that back catalog of like yeah we talked about that yeah <laughs> yep. it's like going back i'm like i remember that yeah well you know what heather we just earned ourselves a ding so there we go so there you go. And uh, thank you, everybody, who's uh, been along with us for the uh, three-year journey. Now, Heather, while we were talking about one of our favorite science stories, maybe we should continue along that thread. Should we uh, head over to Mars and see what's up with our favorite rover? Let's go. And lift off of the Atlas V with curiosity. <laughs> yes! Right there! <laughs> okay, Heather, how is our favorite rover? Alrighty, we have drilled into the rock. We've talked we've talked about the last couple of weeks. We've actually, you know, have some imaging that shows the you know, close ups of it and the kind of the area surrounding it. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, that have, area surrounding one's a great one. Yeah, so now they've kind of looked at it and it's like, okay, well, we have it. We actually filled in one of the holes with some of the cuttings uh, from the other one. Now they actually have. Uh, they're kind of looking at all the results that they have from the laser. Uh, they had, you know, fresh boreholes at the laser for uh, spectrometry for that. So they're really looking at that. So what they found really interesting, as we've been saying, is that when they drilled into it, the surface of the rock was fairly red. What they pulled out was this dark gray material. Yeah. Which is very different. So it made us say, okay, well, that's definitely something to look forward to, that we're going to have something very different from what we've seen before. Now we've pulverized and they've sieved some samples they're on board ready to go to the uh the chemical analysis the compositional analysis um now they looked at everything and said all right from what they saw they decided one drilling at this location was enough so they're not going to be drilling other uh rocks where they where they are now so they've got all the uh you know they've got scoops of samples from inside the rock so they're going to start driving to their next location while uh and then start doing the uh, the testing sort of as they drove. This is what happened kind of the last times when they did drilling. They they kept the little they kept their uh, their cup of dirt, and they kept driving. They're like, okay, now dump a little bit of this into those samples and keep going. So it really allows them a long time to. They don't have to stop and do all the research right where they are. They can keep driving to the next location. Mm. I mean, which is their next goal is fairly far away where they are is about two and a half miles four kilometers from where they started now they still have that much farther to go 
in order to get to the foothills of Mount Sharp, uh, where they're trying to go to, which is sometime later this year they're expecting to reach it. So between here and later this year, they're going to be doing a lot of long-term driving, um, possibly some occasional stopping, and you know they might uh, look something or you know laser something for spectrometry. <laughs> yeah, spectrom- you know, random random laser things. Randomly laser shoot lasers at things <laughs> because everyone talks to me is like, hey, can you give me a rover with a laser? I need the one with I the laser. I really like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they with the laser is very important to them. <laughs> But as of right now, their plan is to get for no more drillings until they hit the uh, the foothills of the mountain. Right. Now, of course, they might they might find something here or there to actually decide to drill, but they'll probably they'll definitely find a couple of spots that they want to stop, take pictures of, um, you know, take the little arm, go out, take some close up pictures of various rocks. So we shall see what happens. But as of right now, we're kind of in the we're in the driving mode. Okay. We're going to be, over the next probably month or two, we're going to be getting little bits and pieces of the uh, analysis as it comes back. And there's probably going to be a long drive of driving. Right. So be a lot of just sort of, yes, we're continuing on. Hey, we saw something cool over there. Yeah. We've made note of it. Yeah. That just sometimes you got to travel. You got to travel, yep. Heather. All right. Well, very good. And uh, Heather has uh, some links to some of those pictures. If you're listening to the audio version and want to see some of the holes that the uh, little rover has been drilling, you can. Just go click the links over in the show notes. All right, Heather, stand by. Get in the time machine because uh, we got to travel back. Uh, are you ready? I'm ready. Oh, oh. Oh, close the door. Oh, that was close. Oh, my God. I don't know where that would have left us if you would have fallen out. we got to get the seatbelts fixed. So this week, yes. I'm sorry, the time machine takes us back 95 years ago, May 29th, 1919. Heather, what happened this week in science? Einstein's theory of relativity is proved. Oh, that's a big one. 95 yes. years ago. Yep. A solar eclipse prom- permitted observations of the bending of starlight passing through the gra- sun's gravitational field. So that, you know, the moon was directly in front of the sun, which means they could observe stars on either side of it. Now, through some calculations there, we'll say, hey, the light, you say the light itself had been bent by the the sun's gravity, which is exactly as Albert Einstein had predicted. Now, there were several expeditions uh, that went to Brazil off the west coast of Africa uh, and various locations that said, so they all made measurements of these stars very close to the sun during the solar eclipse. And all of them were able to see these same results. So that was the key point of the theory of relativity that said gravity is affected by energy or by, so, uh, by gra- you know, gravity, energy, and light. But they all had to interact with each other. Hmm. So a solar eclipse is always a, is a bright moment that makes a lot of difference yeah. And, uh, throughout history, they said, oh, my goodness, things are happening. But in this case, <laughs> it actually proved a major theory. Well, there you go. There you go. Congratulations, Mr. Einstein, 95 years ago. And thanks for celebrating with us on the Cybite anniversary, too. That's yes. pretty cool. All right, Heather, well, let me recalibrate the Cybite 2000 so that way we can look up into the sky this week. All right, this week on May the 28th. Wednesday, we've got the new moon, specifically at 2.40 p.m. Eastern Daylight. On Friday, May the 30th, about 20 to 30 minutes after sunset, look low in the west and northwest, and you can see the lo- the hairline crescent of the moon. You'll see, you might see Mercury just to its rise. Now, they're both going to set fairly quickly, so don't feel bad if you miss them, but you can look far to the upper left. You'll you have more time to see Jupiter. Cool. On- on Saturday, May the 31st, look about an hour after sunset, now Jupiter's going to be directly to the could be the upper right of the moon in the early evening. And on Sunday, hour after sunset, it moves to the left and slightly higher. So it's all going to be kind of in various positions to the moon as the week progresses, about an hour after sunset. sunset. On the whole, this week, we've got Mercury at twilight. It's going to be at its, it's at its highest point in the sky for this entire year for the mid-northern latitudes. But it's going to be fading fairly quickly. As twilight deepens, look to the west and northwest. Low, it's going to be fading. It's going to be dipping out of the horizon. 
it's not a very exciting planet to see, and it's kind of had its moment in the sun, and it's heading to uh, non-visible status now. Venus, our morning star in the dawn, is low to the east during the dawn. It's going to be moving to its highest point in the south around late twilight. Now, Mars is at its highest point in the south at late twilight, and it sets to the west about 3 or 4 a.m. daylight savings time. Jupiter at twilight is in the west, sinking during the evening, setting around 11 or 12. And that's going to be on the far side of the sun from us right now. So it's actually at its minimum apparent size. So it's kind of at its smallest uh, diameter as we can see it right now. So if you look in your telescope, it's going to be fairly small. Saturn is in the evenings as well, appearing in the southeast. Sort of moving to its highest position in the south about 11 or 12 p.m. Mm. So we have a lot of different things happening, mostly in the twilight and the evenings. Yeah. Yeah, well, there. you know what? If you wanted to catch any of that, I got a pro tip for you. This is something I only tell people who listen to all of SciBite, so this makes you a SciBite expert. If you go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com and click on SciBite 132, guess what? All of Heather's notes with extra links and everything right there, including what's up in the sky. It's all listed for you. You can go through there if you see something. And, uh, oh, what was that? Oh, go look in the show notes. Boom, Bob's your uncle. Makes you look smart at parties. I've heard uh, a couple met that way and got married a couple of years ago and have had a kid. See what we've done over the run of the side by show? I can't confirm if that's true or not, uh, but I've heard that. So I don't yeah. know. Yeah. All right, Heather, is there anything else we want to cover this week? Not that I can think of. All right. Well, very good. Well, I'd like to invite you to get a hold of us. Go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com, click the contact link, and choose SciBite from the dropdown. Or even better, you can tweet right at Heather, just JB underscore Mars underscore base on the Twitter. All right, Heather. Well, thanks for the great show. Thank you. And thanks for a great three years. Exactly. All right, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning this week's episode of SciBite. We'll see you right back here next week.